we, we decided to break this down into five areas, uh, DAO 101, kind of the history, DAOs today, DAOs tomorrow, and then just resources for those who are interested. Um, so to start with kind of the DAO 101, or what is a DAO? So a DAO, you can think of it as, it stands for Decentralized Autonomous uh, and Organization. So it's decentralized uh, in the sense that there's no central leadership and decisions are made up in a bottom-up way. Uh, it's autonomous, uh, which means that it takes a life of its own and kind of exists without um, kind of really needing a classic kind of organizational bureaucracy. And it's an organization which has its own rules uh, and can choose things such as uh, managing its funds. So the kind of a formal definition of a DAO, which we have on the right, is that it's an internet native entity with no central management, uh, has automatically enforceable rules on a public blockchain and brings people to achieve a shared common mission. So obviously that might sound a little bit vague, um, but if you think about it kind of throughout the course of human history, people have been organizing themselves and trying to figure out how to automate um, their organizations and make themselves uh, more and more efficient. And the way that we like to think of it is that a DAO is sort of like a, a playground in a sense where kind of it takes these kind of transactions that happen on the internet typically and uh, really create the proper incentive mechanisms to turn them into something real beyond just an online community. Um, so you might ask like, how are DAOs different from traditional organizations? Um, in a traditional organization, kind of the ability to make an LLC or a C Corp is granted by the state. Uh, assets are custodied by banks. Um, property rights are enforced by some type of police or, or law. Uh, ownership and governance are intermediated by lawyers and disputes are settled by courts. Um, the DAO kind of turns this on its head. Um, the permission to exist for a DAO is permissionless. Uh, anyone can make a DAO on a public blockchain. Um, assets are held in crypto dollars. Um, so it could be any type of cryptocurrency or a DAO's native token or a stable coin. Property rights are tracked by on the blockchain. Um, ownership and governance are remediated through software and um, disputes are settled through arbitration networks. Um, so you might ask like, what are DAOs good for? Uh, why, why would someone want to make a DAO as opposed to kind of having a regular online community or a regular organization? Well, number one is DAOs allow for borderless communication and kind of allow for uh, not just kind of global companies, but collaboration like on the internet between many different groups of people and really making sure that their interests are aligned. Uh, they have organizational transparency. Um, Decision-making is participatory. Uh, in a DAO, any, like, everyone who's part of it can be an owner and they're really novel ownership allocation mechanisms as opposed to kind of a more traditional company uh, in which kind of anyone who's gone through the process of investing in a company or uh, receiving stock in a company knows kind of how much of a, a pain that is to really understand what the mechanisms around that are. A DAO can fundraise in very novel ways and it has trustless fund management. So kind of if say, Ori and I have a company and we have uh, 30 employees in a traditional company. There's nothing um, that those employees could necessarily do in a traditional sense if we kind of decided uh, we want to spend our money on this or that or this. Whereas in a DAO kind of those funds are held by the DAO itself. And in order to really do anything with them, um, you need to have proposals or some sort of voting mechanisms. So how do DAOs work? Um, there is governance based on kind of shares, which could be both tokens or reputation or oracles. For instance, you could have a DAO that, for instance, uh, if the weather is below 70 degrees in Palo Alto or wherever everyone else is currently, um, then it um, kind of makes a proposal to give everyone ice cream because it's a, it's a colder day. Um, and kind of the DAO governs uh, both its logic and its resources. And with those logic and resources, it can choose to distribute new funds or uh, mint new shares. If say like another person comes in to the DAO or someone wants to grant uh, kind of more ownership of the DAO to someone else, it can provide services and it can even govern external systems. Uh, so for instance, you could imagine a world where uh, the code of Facebook is governed by a DAO and any changes are approved. Um, you also see here this kind of circular thing with upgrade. The DAO can kind of choose to upgrade itself and its own logic. 
Um, so kind of for examples of DAO mechanisms, uh, the point that we want to drive home is that this isn't just kind of your standard company or, um, or organization on a blockchain. They're really interesting mechanisms as far as capital formation and share distribution. Uh, for instance, uh, on the left here, you see kind of the classic bonding curve mechanism where people can buy at a certain price and sell at a lower price. And kind of as people buy more shares into uh, a DAO or a network, um, a DAO can increase its treasury and uh, begin having funds that way. There are also mechanisms such as liquidity mining or airdrops, which were kind of popularized this past year in the DeFi space by Uni and OneInch and several other projects in which kind of users of a certain project are now, kind of, they wake up one day and they're like, oh, well now I have a lot of this Uni token or OneInch token sort of as a reward for being part of this network. Um, DAOs can have very precise decision-making. So based on say uh, someone's reputation or token weighting. So if anyone is familiar, say with like the, the Bridgewater mechanism of uh, decisions are allocated based on reputation or, or emotions, uh, DAOs can take that to the next level. There's mechanisms of quadratic voting, which have been popularized in Gitcoin, which is a kind of a grant uh, mechanism. And you can even uh, choose decisions or choose to align decisions with really interesting prediction market me mechanisms. And finally, DAOs have uh, different value capture mechanisms. So you can have revenue share algorithmically encoded into a DAO in which kind of any revenue that a uh, DAO makes can be split between token holders themselves and the treasury or token holders themselves even can have a claim on a percentage of the treasury. So if they want to exit all at once or rage quit as it's called, uh, they can actually retrieve some of their funds or even more of their funds than they initially put if the DAO was successful. Dan Larimer kind of first described um, that like Bitcoin actually as a DAO. He was like, you, you can think of um, Bitcoins as shares in a decentralized autonomous corporation that we call Bitcoin. Today, today the term is more narrowly um, used to describe kind of smart contract based entities that live on top of a blockchain. It's less popular to call Bitcoin itself a DAO, although you could think of it like that. It's kind of like meta, there's, there's DAOs uh, like living on top of other DAOs, like if you think of Ethereum, which is a, a, a big smart contract uh, platform, um, you can think of Ethereum itself as a DAO, but we're kind of more narrowly just speaking about DAOs that live on top of smart contract platforms like Ethereum. And so uh, Vitalik went, went in depth in this, we'll share the link for his blog post, but that was really like influential um, in defining what a DAO is. And, and at a high level, uh, he defines a DAO as um, a system where there's kind of like automation at the center and humans at the edges, um, rather than having like in a traditional corporation, like humans in the center, like accountants and bureaucrats and lawyers um, and managers. And in, in the DAO, all the administrative stuff is, is handled by software, but it's not like this cyborg entity that's just like deciding based on algorithms. There actually are people involved, but they're, they're actually just doing the creative work um, or the intellectual work or the, um, yeah, the, the labor that's not administrative. And so the first time this was experimented with um, at scale was in 2016 when a group of Ethereum developers uh, coded the DAO is what they called it. And it ended up being like the most popular thing ever on Ethereum at the time. And I believe it was the largest, largest uh, crowdfunding event uh, ever. Uh, it raised $150 million uh, quite quickly. I think when, within a couple of weeks, but I'm not, I'm not sure on the time frame. And unfortunately there was a bug in the code and the money was drained and the project got shut down and it led to a giant, giant controversy in the Ethereum community. And it really almost uh, killed Ethereum before Ethereum started getting traction, but luckily the community recovered and people kept building. Uh, and it's important to note that it wasn't a bug in, in, the, in, the, in the blockchain. Uh, it, was a, it was a bug in the smart contract that had encoded the logic of the DAO. Basically there was like some sort of um, error in the way some uh, internal balance was being calculated and someone realized they could like hit the contract more times and trick it trick its internal accounting and then hit make a withdrawal and without the approval that was like uh, intended to be uh, required for the withdrawal. But the idea was, was a powerful one. It like um, galvanized the whole Ethereum community. Um, people had this um, vision of this, this big DAO uh, kind of funding all of the new developments that were going on in the space and then getting shares in all the new projects it was developing um, and then making a return for its initial investors. So basically decentralized VC. And so after the failure of the DAO, uh, we, we got the ICO Mania, which had no DAOs, basically. It was um, 
all about the individual teams. The space kind of fragmented and everyone just ran off into their own uh, teams and raised money um, using smart contracts. So they, so they crowdfunded the, um, they crowdsourced the capital formation, but they kind of skipped the part of crowdsourcing the allocation of, of the funds and the decision making. So what you had is a lot of unaccountable teams raising a lot of money in euphoric times um, and promising that like, oh yeah, that, that $10 million that you gave us, we're, we're totally gonna like build the system we promised and then eventually decentralize this, the governance of the system and decentralize the governance of the funds. But most of them failed before getting to that point. And with the, with the ICO um, era, we got the funding of these new DAO frameworks uh, that, that intended to make launching a DAO as easy as possible to make it like this, um, you know, Facebook-esque experience of a couple clicks, a um, couple parameters, and boom, you have your DAO. And these have uh, waned and waxed in popularity. Um, but at the, in 2018, this was basically the way that people started experimenting with DAOs. And you saw um, the rise of not a lot, but some like hobbyist DAOs. You know, we're going to make a DAO um, about like uh, reading scientific journal articles and like rewarding people who commit reviews and stuff, but really um, experimental early, early stage stuff. Um, but the, the, DAO, the DAO world was, was quietly building. Um, so. And in 2019, um, we see some of the first uh, like real use cases emerge that actually have um, a product market fit, a, a business or an economic model. Um, and so I'll go, I'll go through a couple of these, uh, but Moloch was, was an exciting one that was launched, I guess, in February of 2019 um, to fund ecosystem development in, in Ethereum. And so it was more like a, a nonprofit DAO. You could think of it like a, a grants program where a lot of um, like celebrities in the crypto space pledged capital and they, they coded this very simple DAO that would let them pledge their capital and then have proportional voting rights over how the capital was spent. And they all kind of like publicly agreed, we're gonna fund public goods. We're gonna fund things that are good for everyone, uh, developer tools, um, open, open source projects. Um, and, that, and that kind of like reignited uh, excitement around DAOs, you could say. Um, and then uh, Diorg, full disclosure, I was a, was a co-founder of Diorg. We started in January of 2019 as a dev collective that was building DAO software and other crypto software for crypto companies and running our dev collective as a DAO. So the self-reflexive uh, DAO to help build DAOs. And we actually formed a legal entity in Vermont uh, using the new statute that they had passed called the Blockchain Based Limited Liability Corporate Company. So we were the first um, DAO BBLLC. We, we worked with lawyers in Vermont to have like a legal personhood for our DAO, which was important because, you know, we were real people who wanted to work for the DAO and get paid by the DAO and be compliant, right? We wanted to be able to have tax forms at the end of the year for how much we made. And since then, there's been like a lot more experimentation with the DAO um, legal hybrids. Um, and Nexus Mutual, was another project that launched that year um, that was basically like a DAO that provides insurance coverage for smart contract failure. So earlier we talked about the bug that was in the DAO code. And so now today there's Nexus Mutual. So you can buy insurance um, on a smart contract with Nexus Mutual. And if there ends up being a bug in that um, code, then you can make a claim to Nexus Mutual and say, hey, I bought cover. Um, I, you know, I put my funds into this system and it broke. Um, but I bought cover ahead of time. So the Nexus Mutual DAO will process your claim and accept it and pay you out. And there's all these token incentives around the DAO being honest uh, in, in the claims that it's processing. And Nexus Mutual also did some pretty interesting legal work with a UK company limited by guarantee, basically like um, a cooperative where every token holder in the Nexus Mutual DAO um, gets um, their personal information taken, they get KYC'd, you know your customer, and then they're a legal member of the um, Nexus Mutual um, DAO. And then we come to the, the DeFi craze that we're in the middle of right now. Um, it all got, kind of got kicked off with Compound. I think in May, uh, kicked off their liquidity mining program, which they said anyone using the Compound protocol, which is like a money markets protocol where people can borrow and lend. And so they had been live for maybe a year. Um, and then they started incentivizing people to use the protocol by um, taking their, launching their token, the comp token, and, and giving it to everyone who was using the system proportionally to how much they were using it. And at the same time, they launched the Compound DAO, which was like a token holder governed DAO that would govern the Compound system. So there's a couple like key parameters in the code of Compound, like the different interest rates, the different like um, collateralization ratios. 
And so now the comp token holders who um, are a mix of the original team, their original investors, and then the users of the protocol are governing the compound system. And so this really kicked off like a wave of, um, of innovation and capital formation and crypto again, it kind of like is a repeat of the 2017 um, wildness, but in a, in a very different way. This time there's, there's DAOs. So this time, um, you know, people are, are launching new projects, they're raising money, maybe they already raised money, um, and then they're launching tokens that give their users governance rights over the systems that they're using. Um, so we saw like Uniswap, which Ron mentioned, did a big airdrop where anyone who had been using Uniswap over the pre previous two years that it had been live, which is basically just a swapping protocol, they got an airdrop one day, they, they opened up their wallet and they say, whoa, I have, I have uh, 400 uni tokens. And now they're members of the DAO and they can vote um, and influence the system that they're using. And, and the good came with the bad. I mean, there was definitely some, uh, like there's definitely still a lot of exuberance and um, low, low quality projects along with the good ones, um, like there was in 2017 because there's these exciting new mechanisms. And so there's like a lot of um, new projects popping up every day. So like, it's a really um, exciting, but also like dangerous space where you have to be careful, like, cause some projects are, um, you know, like fraudulent or, or, or just um, don't make sense. And people just like came up with it overnight, hit copy paste, and then like launched a, a DAO that supposedly does something interesting. But yeah, th these are some that are, that are definitely doing um, like interesting stuff. And, and like, we're, we're still seeing like new ones pop up like every other week. Yeah, and like, it's interesting to think about why was DeFi the first use case where, where we really saw traction because DAOs can be used for anything, right? Um, but D D DeFi kind of makes sense that it was the first uh, use case to take off. One, because you're dealing with um, lots of user funds. And so, um, as Jan mentioned, like a lot of times the decentralized protocols, like still it's like a single team that still has the keys because um, there is software developers who, who are making these smart contracts and they can like program permissions for them to be able to like upgrade and freeze and edit the smart contracts. Um, and so, um, in DeFi, like this becomes a big liability because um, you might have billions of dollars of user funds uh, in a system do doing something, and you don't want um, some unaccountable small team to have control over that. And so with DeFi, it was, it was very urgent to quickly decentralize as these systems started to gain traction. So with the, with the growth of DeFi, which stands for decentralized finance, um, there was a growing demand for robust governance solutions. Um, it's also in a regulatory gray area where how these DeFi um, systems fit into the existing uh, regulatory framework because they're non-custodial for the most part. You're not trusting um, an institution to hold user funds. Users control their own funds and put it into the smart contracts and can pull it out. Um, but there is uh, controls that you know sometimes the team have to, to make upgrades. And so part of um, their regulatory strategy is to get to hand off control to their users as soon as possible. Um, and, and yeah, it's a multi, it's, it's both better for both sides often. So now we can walk a bit through, we got a bit through the landscape just now, but uh, I'll kind of like give another quick, quick pass through um, of what's going on today and kind of thinking about um, a taxonomy that's starting to emerge. So like, like we started with, um, with the Moloch DAO earlier, uh, there's, there was a couple other grant DAOs that are, you can think of them as like nonprofits on the, on the blockchain. And so there was like a kind of funny one uh, last year, two, two years ago, I guess, for Andrew Yang's uh, presidential campaign, just like raising money to like fund memes for the Yang campaign. Um, there's a cool project in Curacao um, to uh, raise money and spend money on social good projects in that island. So like trash cleanup efforts, uh, educational uh, events. Yeah, and then we also touched on um, some of the uh, financially focused DAOs that um, comprise like the DeFi space. For example, there's Yearn, which is um, constantly like um, uh, moving the pooled funds into different like um, strategies that will return, um, uh, will make a return for the, the liquidity providers. And PyDAO is another example where it's basically doing ETFs on the blockchain. And, and there's, this space is explosive. I mean, this, this slide doesn't even begin to give you an idea and then we also have venture capital on the blockchain. This is kind of more similar to the original DAO that we talked about. Um, so like uh, pulling investor funds and then deploying that capital um, to new projects and trying to make a return. 
and there's some um, service collectives that use crypto to coordinate. So, you know, um, funds come in from customers and then um, work gets done and then uh, funds get distributed to the workers through usually through proposals and voting. And then this is largely what we talked about at the end of the uh, history lesson where they're using um, tokens to govern systems that are already live and maybe weren't a DAO at first. They were like a normal centralized team and then they DAOified kind of later on. And uh, Rarible is, is another example that's not DeFi related, which is like a digital collectibles marketplace. So like uh, tokenized artwork and even potentially um, real world assets in the future, like like real estate. So as far as the, the DAOs of tomorrow, um, kind of currently, Currently, the DAO space is very self-referential in a sense. Uh, it's using crypto to govern uh, crypto. Um, the way that we see it, though, is that the design space is limitless. And kind of what we really want to impress on everyone is that uh, kind of there is a future uh, that is not very far away in which kind of regular products or kind of regular organizations at all at all levels could be governed by these types of mechanisms. Um, so kind of one obvious example is platform governance. Um, kind of touching on the Facebook example earlier um, and kind of all the issues with Facebook, uh, Amazon, Google uh, that have come up over the last few years. And kind of imagining a user owned platform uh, that, or a platform that's really owned by its users. Um, I think one example that's kind of really inspirational to me in a sense is when DoorDash IPO'd uh, earlier this year where their CEO, Tony Hsu, mentioned uh, in a tweet, like, hey, well, we're going to be giving our most active dashers a cash bonus uh, from $300 to, to 20K, and we'll be supporting the dashers um, kind of because of that. And I think DAOifying kind of a DoorDash or DAOifying a Facebook is actually a much simpler mechanism to do this. It doesn't rely on the benevolence of someone like Tony Hsu to be like, ah, I want to give everyone $300 to $20,000 because now we're uh, IPO'd or ICO'd. It'd be like, ah, oh, well, actually, the early dashers actually were getting some uh, equivalent of a DoorDash token. And once that became liquid, then kind of they algorithmically would have an amount relative to uh, the amount of driving that they did or the amount of deliveries that they made. And you might ask why that's better. Well, it actually, it's a really great mechanism as far as uh, fundraising and explosive growth. So if you compare a DoorDash to, or a Facebook to a platform owned DoorDash and Facebook, uh, people who are early believers and early evangelists uh, will want to, for instance, use uh, the kind of crypto version of it as their more financial incentives as it grows. So there are a lot of really powerful network effects that can emerge, and kind of it's to be seen whether uh, these current Web two platforms end up switching to a more DAO native model, or if they end up kind of going to insignificance as time goes on, as uh, DAOs end up governing kind of analogous or better platforms? DAOs are just a coordination tool. So it doesn't just have to be for companies. Um, it can be for movements. You know, you have lots of people coordinating actions, um, coordinating boycotts or protests. Similarly, you could imagine startups and small businesses being run uh, on a DAO. So, I mean, as far as um, kind of entrepreneurship in the United States, kind of uh, it's hard to believe, especially if you're at an institution like Stanford where so much is going on, but the number of new startups and small businesses that have been formed over the last 30 years has been in a huge decline. And I think one reason for that is just uh, the difficulty in creating uh, in like the infrastructure for these businesses. So kind of we think that there could very well be a future where you'd have your flower shop or your kind of your classic neighborhood grocery store on a Dow. And what it would give you is when you'd have kind of different access mechanisms to credit, some of which may be better because there's more in the design space uh, as opposed to kind of going to a bank for a loan or in the startup standpoint of uh, going to a venture capitalist to raise a seed round. Uh, you can crowdfund more easily. So if Ori, for instance, wanted to open a vegan ice cream shop in my neighborhood, kind of I could say, ah, oh, well, I really believe in vegan ice cream. And kind of I, I would love to see a vegan ice cream shop in my neighborhood or in um, kind of a random city like Sedona, Arizona, and kind of other people who feel really strongly about that mission can also contribute their funds. And it can be sort of like a Kickstarter, but where it's actually part of a company in which, uh, for instance, those people who were early contributors could have uh, very codified or 
um, mechanism that they can trust to actually get a benefit from that. So maybe when I go to Ori's uh, vegan ice cream shop, like I get a free waffle cone or whatever with my ice cream. Uh, there's lower administrative overhead. So if anyone here has actually gone through the process of starting a business and kind of getting lawyers or starting an LLC and um, kind of being able to do all of your accounting and all of your company formation and employees on chain actually makes things a lot easier to track. We also see DAOs potentially going into territorial governance. So ranging from neighborhoods to municipalities to nation states. Um, so there's been a lot of talk, particularly in 2020, with how kind of bad COVID response has been in some areas of uh, starting new cities or creating new green zones in which kind of they would be COVID safe. And one potential way to organize that is actually through um, a DAO in which you would crowdfund for territory or um, have very specific bylaws that everyone can transparently see. Uh, so kind of overall, uh, a DAO could be kind of civic engagement uh, in the US and in a lot of developed countries is, is at a low. And I feel a, a big reason for that is that people don't actually feel like they have any governance or they don't really have any say over decisions. So DAOs could be kind of a really interesting mechanism to uh, start encouraging that more. Yeah, Ron, that was wonderful. Ori, um, excellent, excellent job. Um, let's take a lot of questions. I'm sure people um, have a lot of things on their mind. Yes, yeah, so I see a question in the chat. Who approves the DAO logic? Uh, how is that decided if everyone has shared ownership? Um, so yeah, I guess at first, you know, a person. So if I have an idea for a DAO, I could code up the smart contract for it or cop fork an existing uh, smart contract out there, use one of the frameworks, plug in the parameters, the initial members and launch it. Uh, but after the moment it's launched, the, the DAO decides on the DAO logic. Um, so you could make a vote. Um, and, and if you're curious, like how this happens, uh, like at the smart contract layer, there's a popular design pattern called like the proxy pattern where you'll, so as you probably know, like uh, smart contracts and data on the blockchain is immutable. So you'll, you'll deploy the smart contract and it's, it's there forever. You can't take it down um, or edit the actual code, only like uh, d data in the code. Um, but what people do is they'll deploy a proxy smart contract that has a pointer to the current logic of the DAO. And then if, and then the DAO has governance over the pointer. So the DAO could pass a, pass a proposal to move the pointer to this new logic that someone coded up or that replaces one um, function in the original logic. So it, it would be DAO governed once launched, but you know anyone's welcome to, to launch a DAO. I mean, you can launch a DAO without permission from the people in the DAO, right? Like I, I could launch, if I had all of your Ethereum addresses, I could launch a DAO right now where you're all, you all have hundred shares and you wouldn't even know about it. But like uh, if you came to that DAO, you could, you could then vote. Um, I see a question, what, what would be the incentive for the team to build DAO? Um, like when there's less incentive for the team. So, so yeah, why would you build like this collective when you could just be a dictator, I guess is the question. <laughs> um, and so I would argue that there's kind of, um, yeah, like, like it, it's kind of having a smaller slice of a bigger pie is the simplest way I would put it. Um, there's more powerful incentives involved when you're having shared ownership. And you can see this in the cooperative space in the traditional world. I mean, cooperatives um, take on a huge chunk of like the economic activity of the world, um, like maybe double digits, like around 10, 10 or 20 percent. Um, we don't hear about them a lot. Like it's not as as sexy as, as the unicorn startup by the dictator founder. Um, but cooperatives are actually way have a way, way, way lower failure rate than um, than top down companies, like dramatically lower. Um, but they also have limitations because um, the overhead of coordination is way harder with cooperatives, right? You need um, voting on big decisions. You need people to be informed um, about the corporate governance issues. Um, and, and you need you need to have lots of meetings, right? Like that's a classic critique of cooperatives. It's like, I don't want to go to meetings all the time to talk about governance. And so that's why DAOs are interesting is because you get the, the benefits of like the incentive alignment of a cooperative but then with like the lower overhead of using software. And that's why I think people will flock to DAOs. Yeah, um, kind of to add on to that, I think because of the design space of DAOs is, are so broad, um, you, they're just really interesting mechanisms as far as getting more people or even bootstrapping projects that wouldn't otherwise exist. So 
uh, as one example. Um, or you could say, ah, I want to form a new university and like the university will be governed on a DAO. Well, there haven't been very many good universities started in the last 100 years, but something that you could say in a DAO like that is, ah, well, we'll bring all of these professors and we'll not only pay them salary, but they'll also have a lot of governance in the university itself. And I think it's a mechanism in which you can kind of uh, get a lot of network effects that you wouldn't otherwise get in a traditional company. And as Ori said, kind of get a smaller splice of a much bigger pie. Um, also, I see uh, CK and Ross have questions. We'll address the questions in the chat too. I just want to make sure. Um, yeah, CK has been understand. super patient. Yeah. Okay. I want this is a great presentation. Learned a lot. Um, how do you guys think about like connecting the digital assets like on chain or within the DAO to physical assets? So specifically, you mentioned like service-based DAOs, ownership of physical assets, uh, territorial governance. So it seems like there is a potential for disconnects when it comes to that. So say, for instance, with physical assets, I purchase something from somebody, then I actually get it. And I realize a month later that for whatever reason, it wasn't exactly what was specified. Like, how do you think about actually, I guess, addressing those within the DAO because it's code? Yeah, that, that's a great question and this kind of intractable problem that people talk about a lot in the space. We haven't seen many examples of it um, functioning in practice, but there's been a lot of discussion of like how you can make it happen. And um, one, one thing we've seen is like novel legal structures where like a trust, for example, where you have um, a trustee who, um, or I'm gonna get it wrong, but or, yeah, the trustee uh, is kind of bound like with, with a fiduciary status to execute the will of the token holders or the will of the DAO. And so you can have this, um, this legal entity set up that's basically just a proxy for the DAO in the real world. So um, if the DAO wants to purchase real estate, well, the trustee goes to the property register office and, and signs the paperwork and the DAO transfers the funds maybe to the trustee and the trustee's uh, bank account uh, transfers it to the, to the property owner. And now the DAO has this like legal claim on a physical asset. Um, so, so there's been there's been some interesting projects. I'll send uh, the name of one called Materium, kind of like matter plus Ethereum. And they, they have this whole idea of automated custodians, which is kind of what I just described. You would have these people who, who put a bond down, like they put um, some of their own money in a smart contract controlled by the DAO. And then the DAO kind of tells them what to do. Um, and if they don't do it, they lose the money they put in. So you could have like even crypto economics that enforce the kind of like conformity of the real world actions with the digital world like commands. Uh, but, but yeah, there's there's a lot um, of work to be done there. We haven't we haven't really seen it in practice yet. Uh, the, the legal entity that the that Dorg set up was kind of an attempt at this also, where you have like uh, bylaws of a U.S. company with a pointer in it to a smart contract, right? So in our bylaws, it says, you know, the decision-making authority for X, Y, Z, for, you know, all the uh, operational aspects of the company are, are vested in this um, DAO. We've yet to see it, if that's gonna hold up in court. I mean, like it, it really, you don't know until these things get challenged and settled um, in courts, but yeah, there, there's totally space for this like disconnect to happen. And that's why the DAO space so far, like Ron said, is, is really self-referential at this point. This quick follow up on that point, um, a lot of the conversations with the um, US judicial system as it relates to the crypto world, um, the first question that always comes up within the first minute is, if something goes wrong, who do we arrest? So there is um, like very considerable confusion and unease about like, who do we sue? Who do we arrest? Who's to blame? Who's the person who is responsible? And then when crypto people go off into a long explanation of, oh, you know, this is a bunch of code that's floating out in the ether, um, a, a typical uh, judge uh, will be profoundly like confused and disconcerted by that. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's a lot of lawyers in the space working on exactly these problems, um, like making new laws. Wyoming has been leading the charge uh, in the US and Vermont. Um, uh, 
the UK has, has been friendly to, to the idea of DAOs incorporating like with the Nexus Mutual example. And yeah, th this question is kind of totally unsolved and it's just gonna have to explode one day um, and get settled in, 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 in case specific ways. Like, I don't think there's any way to, to architect a perfect system. Um, but yeah, there's different ways where you can have hybrid forms, you know, like um, a, a person in real life forms a company and they're liable to a certain extent, or maybe there's a law written that says they're not liable. Um, it, it's completely unknown. I agree. Ross has been very patient as well. Thank you guys both for coming today. This has been super helpful. Um, I thought it was a bit funny that, and maybe ironic that Liberty Mutual is you know, providing this insurance on Dow smart contracts. Um, and I, I think that gets to this like fundamental question with DAOs is I think today most people feel like there should be like what happens if the computer messes up, if the algorithm's not right, like you kind of want this underlying human arbitrer. Um, and I, I'm, I'd be, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on, do you see this as just like a temporary stopgap until, you know, uh, DAOs are more proven out? Or do you see that as kind of being a long-term solution where you're gonna need to have these human arbiters if for the cases where things go wrong at some point? Yeah, yeah, great points. Um, I definitely don't think the point of DAOs is to replace humans. It's to replace humans being dehumanized, like turned into administrators. And so a lot, a lot of systems require human judgment. Um, and so, for example, um, there, there are basically DAOs, I think, are an interesting way of moving, of, of inputting human judgment into non-human, like smart contracts. And so, yeah, with the Nexus Mutual case, um, you have this collection of people who are making subjective decisions on, was this bug part of our, you know, was it covered by our policy? Um, and then there's also interesting examples like uh, Kleros you should look into. Uh, which is uh, an, an Aragon court, which are arbitration networks for precisely this issue. You can kind of delegate um, uh, conflict resolution to networks of people. And so with Claros, for example, uh, the, the Claros jurors, you know, anyone can be a Claros juror. You, you stake the Claros token and a random selection of jurors gets chosen. And then the case, the facts of the case gets presented and they all um, vote on the outcome. And if you vote with the majority of voters, you get a small reward, like the fee paid to the arbitration network. And if you vote against what the majority voted, you get um, you you lose the the stake that you put up. And so, the, basically, crypto economics is really about creating games that like help humans achieve shared outcomes. And so, I see it as as more that is what's being done here, rather than let's get rid of humans and have like the world run by robots. Uh, I see that there were a few questions in the chat too that we didn't, we haven't addressed yet. Um, one is, what have been some lessons uh, from orgs like Uniswap transitioning to a DAO model? Are there best practices in the space yet? Um, I'm not quite sure. I would say that there are best practices in the in the space. What we've seen work best is the more genuine community involvement there is, the better. And so synthetics, you know, for example, has done that really well. Um, Peep, it's the the space is so nascent that you know we're hearing about new uh, experiments all the time. Um, airdrops are interesting. Um, there's there's a concept of like fair launches that have gotten popular lately, where there's no investors. A project just kind of like launches out of the blue, and the early participants kind of rack up all the equity. But uh, yeah, th there is no best practices in in summary. I tell you, uh, a lot of the kind of current practices around like liquidity mining or creating bonding curves have been a really interesting way to bootstrap projects uh, where kind of the idea is you when you launch a new token, you can create a pair between um, say like the new token and Ethereum or a new token and USDC, USD coin, and kind of in return for kind of allowing people to facilitate those trades or doing that automatic market making, uh, you receive even more of the token. So. Um, and, and same with the bonding curve mechanisms that kind of in these fair launch systems, allowing people to uh, really have a reason to buy early as opposed to late, uh, because if they buy later, they'll have less say in a system. So 
I think there's a combination of both um, kind of people who encouraging people who treat it as an investment and also uh, the communities that are truly genuine communities and truly want to build around the product. Um, another question here was, could we potentially create a no code DAO creation tool, enter governance rules using a template um, and boom, everything is taken care of. I think uh, kind of going back to an earlier slide, that's sort of the vision of DAO stack or Aragon or Colony. Um, and those have succeeded to some degree, but uh, like it's really DeFi that allowed DAOs to capture significant mindshare. Um, yeah, and I think there's a surprising lack of teams working on this exact question. It's there's incredible value there. It's just really hard to pull off. Like these these teams that we've mentioned spent like a lot of time, a lot of development resources, uh, doing doing that just that, and it's it's still in a phase of um, rough usability. And so, yeah, like uh, templating um, and, and, you know, making GUIs for the experience of building a DAO is a really interesting like problem area that I think, you know, in the next couple of years, there'll just be a lot, lots of attempts at solving that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more strongly. Sorry for interjecting a personal opinion, but anyone who's ever um, started a foundation, 5013C, or a, a C Corp, or an LLC, um, there's incredible, um, just uh, silly paperwork to go through, uh, the board minutes, like just all this other stuff, which is really just cookie cutter. If that could be turned into a convenient experience, um, then that, that I, I'm sure there's, uh, you know, there's 50 people on the call now. I'm sure um, we have 65 different things we would like to do today that all involve that particular uh, friction point. So um, I'd certainly be one of your first customers or in Ron if such a system existed. Yeah. And as far as even using these no code systems, I mean, there's a project that Ori and I were with, uh, very actively involved in building over the last few months called Web3 API, which um, it, you can think of the what the project actually does doesn't really matter. It's kind of like a Docker for the Web3 universe. But um, in general, like the fundraise or kind of the the token agreements were made on a DAO, and kind of seeing it as both a builder and an investor, it's been like by far the most pleasant uh, experience as far as raising funds and. Like really getting to transparently see, okay, like these are these are the owners. Uh, this is what will happen, as opposed to kind of the confusion around regular C corps or LLCs or nonprofits. Um, it was really like a seamless experience. Yeah, I also think it's going to be really interesting once that that kind of tool is more mature um, to see the effect it has on the world outside of uh, like what like Europe and America, like where we do have like a strong legal system and strong case law history to make corporate formation relatively easy, even though we're talking about how much of a hassle it is. Um, it's even more of a hassle if you live in uh, most other parts of the world, um, especially some areas where like the judicial system really is, is broken and, and incredibly corrupt. So I think you're going to see um, this be more useful to like emerging markets before it's useful to the first world. Um, and that's going to be interesting because not only could you, you know, form these, these collectives, um, these companies, like with your uh, people you already know, like in your, in your country or in your town, but you can see people forming collectives from all different parts of the world and having like a way stronger legal system, judicial system, arbitration system, fund management system, governance system than they ever would in any of their respective jurisdictions. The, the tech stack for a truly democratic world um, Ron and Ori, uh, this has been absolutely fascinating. I've had a blast. Um, you now have 50 people um, who want to start um, DAOs uh, for their local communities and uh, to help them, uh, you know, make, uh, make, make our surroundings better.